Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. Imagine yourself sitting on grass by a river, under the leaves by an old bayon tree. And everything is calm and quiet except for the sweet sound of the babbling river and the light breeze that brings us the scent of lotus flowers as we dive into another chapter of human history. So now it's time to get comfortable. Allow yourself to relax. Take a deep breath and release slowly and begin our new adventure. If you are so kind, I ask that you subscribe to my channel and click on the like button. This helps me keep the stories from being interrupted by ads. Tonight, I will tell you about the history of Buddhism and what this religion or spiritual tradition is about, how it appeared and how it spread and diversified. Buddhism also questions the Western concept of religion that we are quick to attribute to every spiritual belief, traditions, or rites. So we will also discuss the word religion and its history at the end. With so much more to explore, so please adopt a comfortable position and try to release the tension in your shoulders. We carry so much tension in our shoulders that we are unaware of. Make a conscious effort to let it go. As you exhale and feel how your body relaxes with this single release. As usual, you don't need to watch this video to understand our stories or to follow along. You can close your eyes if you wish to at any time and just focus on the sound of my voice. If you feel sleepy, let it go. You can always come back to resume the video later or to jump directly to a particular part of the story. Timestamps are listed in the first comment under the video. And now let's begin our journey. At the origin of Buddhism, there are the original teachings attributed to a man, a religious teacher, who lived sometime between the 6th and the 5th century BC in ancient India. This man, Siddhartha Gautama, is not mere legend, but did exist. It can be hard to distinguish what is historical fact and what is legend in his life, because, to the Buddhists, he became the historical Buddha, a being that, in our world, reached a state of enlightenment that liberated him from suffering, from ignorance, craving, and from never-ending cycle of rebirth. He achieved this by dedicating his life to finding and following a path, a path that culminated in nirvana, the ultimate state of liberation. Siddhartha Gautama was not really a prophet, someone who would have announced or revealed divine truth. He was even less so a messiah. In the Buddhist tradition, he is a guide and a model of what human beings can aspire to become, a pioneer of sorts, a spiritual explorer. We will come back to his life, 
but his teachings do not arise from nowhere. They were deeply rooted in an intense spiritual activity that existed in India in the first millennium BC. It was a time of intense questioning or speculation about the order of the cosmos, self-knowledge, and what beings became after their biological death. To understand all this, we have to look at what India was in terms of civilization, society, and beliefs at the time of the Buddha. India already had a long history before the 6th century BC. It had seen several cultures and civilizations rise and fall, especially in the Indus Valley, where about at the same time in Mesopotamia, early cities and complex societies had appeared. The Indus Valley is located in the northwest of India and in Pakistan. Little is known about how these societies worked, their political life, or their beliefs. But what we do know, or at least what we are able to discern backed by archaeology, languages, and genetics, among other factors, is that by the middle of the second millennium BC, a thousand years before the time of the Buddha, Indian societies and religions were strongly influenced by the arrival of a migration wave coming from Central Asia, the Indo-Aryan migration. It happened over several centuries starting around 4,000 years ago. The Indo-Aryan peoples were an ethno-linguistic group, meaning that they were ethnically and culturally related. They shared cultural norms and languages, and it left a strong mark on India. The languages spoken today, from Pakistan to Bangladesh, from North India to Sri Lanka, all have Indo-Aryan origins. The Indo-Aryans are parented to the larger Indo-European migration wave, thought to have originated from the steppes north of the Caucasus Mountains six to seven thousand years ago, and over many centuries had a strong influence from the west of Europe to India including all Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Now, the Indo-Aryan wave was a late one in the second millennium BC, and it involved a movement toward the south of people from the Indo-European linguistic group who had settled and stayed in Central Asia for centuries before moving south. It seems that in India like in other parts of the world where they arrived. These Indo-European migration waves had a strong influence on the regions where they were settled. We do not know the numbers exactly, and it is well possible that they were only a minority in these new lands. It is believed that their social norms and organization their beliefs, or maybe their military capabilities were persuasive or powerful, because in the north of India, as in Europe or Persia, they prevailed over more ancient cultures. In the case of India, it is possible that Indo-Aryan chiefs provided protection to non-Aryan populations living from agriculture, establishing a hierarchy in which the Indo-Aryans became a kind of elite class. These elites made alliances and mixed with the old elites, and after generations, 
Indo-Aryans converted the dominant class to their culture and language, which then trickled down to the rest of the population. These are all hypotheses, but in any case, the Indo-Aryan migrations reshaped Indian societies. They mixed with local elements, giving birth to new cultures. For example, Sanskrit, the language that is also the sacred language of Hinduism and many historical texts of Buddhism, is one of the numerous Indo-Aryan languages. It served as a link language in ancient and medieval South Asia, somewhat like Latin in Roman and medieval Europe. By the middle of the second millennium, the new Indo-Aryan kingdoms that had appeared in India, especially in the Northwest, had a culture with new traits. The society was organized into castes. There were priests, the Brahmins, warriors and nobles, common people and servants. This system that places individuals in a caste, depending essentially on their birth, has very old roots in India. This first appeared in the second millennium BC, and though it was officially abolished in 1949, you cannot eliminate such a deep-rooted phenomenon, so it still influences in modern Indian society. Religious beliefs and practices that dominated among the Indo-Aryan peoples were based on a collection of texts called the Vedas. The Vedas are today the most ancient scriptures of Hinduism. The dominant religion in India by the number of believers. But in the beginning, this Vedic religion, based on the Vedas, was only one of the major traditions that shaped Hinduism into what it became over time. It was believed, and is still believed, in Hinduism that the Vedas were revealed texts meaning they had no authors, but that their lines, their verses, had been heard by sages after intense meditation. During the first millennium BC, this historical Vedic religion evolved into another religious tradition called Brahmanism. Brahmanism included other texts, than the original Vedas and gave a central role to the priestly class of society, the caste of the Brahmins. In the West, historically, Brahmanism became a name for Hinduism in the 18th and 19th centuries. The two words were used interchangeably the religion that historians call Brahmanism has marked differences with modern Hinduism. It is only one of its main inspirations. Now, over a millennium from the mid-second millennium to the mid-first millennium, B.C., the time of the Buddha, this historical Vedic religion went through a lot of changes and the introduction of new concepts. The earliest text, the earliest Vedas, mentioned a belief in an afterlife, a place or another dimension where people, rather their spirits or their souls, went after their earthly life, but with time, and the likely influence of local beliefs, this evolved into a belief 
in the doctrine of karma and rebirth, the idea of reincarnation. The term karma is a popular one, but what is karma exactly? Karma is a Sanskrit word that means action, work, or deed. Good actions and good deeds contribute to good karma. The concept of karma is closely associated with the idea of rebirth in many Indian religions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, or Sikhism. Good or bad karma in the present will affect one's future, not only in this life, but will also affect the nature and quality of future lives. It is less known than karma, but maybe you have heard the term samsara, another Sanskrit word which means world. Samsara names the belief in the cyclicality of all life, of all existence, the belief that all life goes through a cycle of death and rebirth in our world, not in another world, afterlife. Samsara, the cycle of reincarnation, is a fundamental belief of most Indian religions and it formed along the centuries as the historical Vedic religion evolved. When the historical Buddha was born, the concepts of karma, of samsara, and the existence of the Vedas as religious scriptures were widespread in the Indian societies where he lived. This is why this little historical perspective is necessary to explain, because these concepts were not born with Buddhism, but were instead embraced by Buddhism. Buddhism provided what would be like a roadmap to concepts that people were already familiar with. But by the 6th century BC, Brahmanism was not the only aspect of religious or spiritual activity in India. As I mentioned earlier, there was a state of intense questioning and speculation about spirituality, about the world, the visible and the invisible, and what happened after death. At the margins of Brahmanism, many individuals tried to explore and to answer these mysteries of existence. They often isolated themselves from society to meditate and think. Many practiced asceticism, which is a lifestyle of voluntary abstinence from sensual pleasures for the purpose of pursuing spiritual goals. Typically, ascetics adopt a very frugal lifestyle, rejecting material possessions and physical indulgences of every kind. They spend a lot of their time fasting and concentrating on the practice of religion or reflection on spiritual matters. Many believe that the action of purifying the body or reducing its needs was a way of finding inner peace or a great connection with the divine. The practice of ascetism has been historically observed in many religions and traditions around the world, but India could have been the place where it first emerged. The concept was mentioned in some Vedic texts which are the most ancient texts we know of that talk about ascetism. By the time of the Buddha, 
the practice was widespread in India. It was still a marginal lifestyle, of course, but it became relatively familiar and common. And it seems there was a belief that controlling one's vital functions, the ability to be detached from one's body, was a way of acquiring supernatural powers or of reaching a state of ecstasy and intense happiness. Another ascetic practice was yoga, yet another Sanskrit term. Yoga was already ancient by the 6th century BC and had been mentioned long before in the Vedas but it became increasingly popular among the ascetics. They believed that practicing a variety of techniques, particularly physical and mental exercises, was a way of strengthening one's mind and connecting with the divine. I'm telling you all of this to illustrate the context and society into which the historical Buddha was born. Concepts like karma or samsara arose from the evolution and mixing of all these influences, both Indo-Aryan and indigenous. Also, there were a number of religious and spiritual practices that had already become widespread in India. Moreover, it was a time by the 6th or 5th century BC of spiritual fervor, one could say, for many people, probably more so than in the same period in other parts of the world, like China or the Mediterranean world. Spirituality beliefs and the divine were the single most important reason to live or the most important goal. Now that we have the background in place, let's talk about the life and achievements of Siddhartha Gautama. It can be very hard to distinguish facts from claims, and to focus. So let's just focus on the historical figure. Was he a real man? The answer is most probably yes. Almost all historians agree on this because his teachings and followers all left a multiplicity of traces on history. It is harder to know exact details like his dates of birth and death, for example. But the traditional date of his death observed in the Eastern Buddhist tradition in China, Japan, or Korea is 949 BC, more than 500 years earlier than what most historians believe. A century ago, the consensus was that he was born and lived in the 6th century B.C. But now it is considered to have been during the 5th century B.C. It is likely that he was born into an aristocratic family. And his place of birth is traditionally considered to be in the ancient city of Lumbini, located in the very north of India, now in modern Nepal. There is a consensus on the fact that he traveled to several places in the north of India throughout his life. And according to all the various traditions, he went through a sequence of stages. After birth, he reached maturity, then a phase of renouncing all worldly possessions and pleasures before starting a search that led to his awakening, his liberation. 
After that, there was a period of teaching that only ended with his death. The dates, and in many cases, the places are hard to establish because no biographies or detailed accounts were written during his lifetime, nor in the one or two centuries thereafter either. The ancient Indians generally unconcerned with chronologies. They focused more on philosophy and events. The earliest written records are from the mid-3rd century BC, with references carved on pillars. The oldest known surviving manuscripts were found in Afghanistan. They are from the first century BC, which is already a dozen generations after his death. As Buddhism gained importance, several biographies were written in the first centuries of our era. They represent different traditions and do not necessarily agree on everything. But from these different sources and historical research, the following biography can be established. After his birth in Lambini, Gotama would have spent his childhood in Kapilavastu, a city that would have been either in Nepal or India in the modern state of Uttar Pradesh. Both places at the same time belong to the same state, the territory of Shakya. He would have been a prince. Later traditions tend to assign to him a very high social origin, and the fact that he didn't have to work as a child supports this. But still, his exact social origin is mysterious. In the Shakya tradition, his mother was a queen, Queen Maya, and then the night Siddhartha was conceived, she was said to have dreamed of a white elephant, and ten months later he was born. Early biographies say almost nothing about the young Gautama's life, but later texts develop a dramatic narrative about prophecies made by Brahmin scholars when he was born, with priests announcing that young Siddhartha would become the first Buddha, or stories of him as a boy discovering the suffering of common people, whereas he lived a luxurious, spoiled life. Then one day, when he was an adolescent or a young adult, he chose to renounce this life and seek a higher spiritual goal by becoming an ascetic. Earlier sources don't elaborate much on this. They just depict that the thought of old age, disease, and death was what led him to his renunciation. Karma believed there might be something better than just wait for it to happen, and trying to forget this sad fate with material possessions and entertainment he held that home life was narrow, a place of impurity, whereas life as an ascetic, free and unencumbered, could provide a pure, holier kind of life. Biographies that are more rooted in legend than history add many unverifiable anecdotes to this narrative. For example, that one day Gautama left his place and seeing the outside world for the first time was shocked by his encounters with poor, suffering people, 
realities he had ignored until then. That he had been shielded from reality. Or that while outside, he encountered an ascetic who inspired him to become one too. Another legend is that his parents opposed his departure. He had been shielded from religious teachings because his father wanted him to become a king and not a priest. So he escaped in the middle of the night. In any case, these narratives all lead to him drastically changing his life and embarking on a spiritual quest and experimenting with different spiritual practices. First, he was said to have tried to join two different teachers of ascetic meditation. And even though he quickly excelled at their techniques, he was unsatisfied because he felt these practices did not lead to calm, to knowledge, or awakening. They were a means of forgetting oneself rather than a means of elevation. And so he next entered into a phase of extreme ascetism, drastically reducing his food intake and drastically imposing forceful mind and forms of breath control. Historic texts report that he became so skinny, so emaciated, that his bones were visible through his skin. These extreme practices and the accompanying physical deterioration led to a revelation that the right path to spiritual awakening was not in the extremes, neither in self indulgence or in self-modification, but rather somewhere in between, the middle way, a path of moderation. His notion of the middle way is very important to Buddhists of all traditions to understand the teachings of the Buddha. First, because it defines a spiritual practice that steers clear of extremes, no exaggerated ascetism, which is seen as a foolish quest for perfection that may well be inspired by egotism or masochism, and on the other hand, no self-indulgence, no indulgence of sensual physical pleasures, all of which take us away from the quest for awakening. But beyond the practice, it is also a call to react with moderation to issues encountered in life and not to fall into extremes like absolutism or radical intolerance or nihilism. The middle way is instead the path that avoids these traps, these blockages. It is a path through which it is possible to advance rather than stay stuck. And so, after this discovery, Siddhartha Gautama would have abandoned extreme ascetism and reoriented his search. This middle way was the discovery of a path, not a destination. So it was time for him to follow this path. He was said to have decided to sit down and to meditate, determined not to get up until achieving a full awakening. Legend has it that he sat under a Bodhi tree a sacred fig tree native to India, located in the modern state of Bihar. 
and it is there he practiced the long meditation called dhyana. Translated as meditation, but this dhyana describes the training of the mind, a way to redirect the mind away from automatic responses to the senses, to clear it from distractions so that it can comprehend the world as it really is. So this dhyana, this meditation, after a long time, would have allowed him to awaken. That is to say, to clearly see the true nature of reality, to see the world as it is. Kotama thus would have become Buddha, an awakened one contrary to most people who are asleep to the true reality. And with this awakening, he would have reached liberation, also called nirvana. Nirvana, another Sanskrit word, is sometimes understood in the West as a state of full and peaceful satisfaction. But it is not this exactly. It is a state of highest happiness, yes, and of freedom. But it is also a liberation from attachments. Attachments to everything, feelings, to people, possessions, the ego, pain. This liberation puts an end to samsara, to the cycle of rebirth that makes us come back. Nirvana is a way out, the only way out, of this eternal repetition and the accompanying suffering. The concept of nirvana does not only exist in Buddhism, it exists in other religions too, including Hinduism. Here again, traditions about this crucial stay under the tree tell of different episodes that would have happened as the future Buddha meditated. It is said that to prevent the Buddha's nirvana, a demon called Mara who ruled over desires and did not want this path to be revealed to mankind, would have tried to tempt him. Mara was said to have sent his beautiful daughters to seduce the future Buddha and then sent armies of monsters to frighten him. But according to legend, the future Buddha stayed unfazed and firmly grounded, which allowed him to repel these attacks. After this awakening, the Buddha traveled again to the lower plains of the Ganges, to the east, teaching and building a religious community. His teachings included the middle way, this path between extremes, the training of the mind, dhyana, and meditation practices as a way to emulate his experience and to also reach Buddhahood. Even though the title Buddha, which means enlightened or awakened one, appeared only a couple of centuries after his death, an aspect of early Buddhism is that the Buddha was critical of the caste system and the practices of the priests. The Brahmin caste as we have seen, there was nothing in his path to nirvana that depended on his family of birth, his social status, or the worship of any particular gods. This new religious movement that emerged around him was a religion without gods. Or if there were gods and supernatural entities, the way to awakening to enlightenment and freedom did not depend on them, and this clashed with the dominant social order. 
Buddhism in the 5th century BC was just a small movement, what we would call a sect. But still, its doctrine could have been seen as a threat to the caste system dominated by the Brahmins. All the more, at least theoretically, appealed to the lower classes. In Brahmanism, there was a pantheon of gods, many of whom continued to be worshipped in Hinduism. The path to gain favors in this life and future lives was to worship these gods, and the means to worship passed only through the Brahm caste, thus creating this intrinsic connection between religion social order, and politics. And even though Buddhism did not necessarily attack all of these directly, it was disruptive. Keeping the striking differences in mind, there was something of this model in the success of early Christianity within the Roman Empire and beyond. Here was a religion open to all that promised a path to salvation, regardless of social origins or wealth, a promise to alleviate or suppress suffering for the poor, a system that proclaims equality between all men. This was appealing to many. But still, like Christianity at the start, Buddhism spread slowly in India. In the beginning, it coexisted with other religions or traditions, especially with ancient Hinduism or late Brahmanism. It benefited in the third century from the conversion of several monarchs to Buddhism. India was politically fragmented, and there was a time when Buddhism reached every corner of India. But in the following centuries, it lost political support. And then, much later, there was the Muslim invasion of the north of the India from the 10th to the 12th centuries. Buddhism did not fully disappear from India but it was significantly reduced and marginalized. However, abroad, Buddhism experienced a remarkable expansion and success. Even though it was a tradition born in India, it was adapted by and lasted much longer in other Asian countries. So let's take a look at the historical spread of Buddhism and the different traditions that were born from it. The heartland of Buddhism historically was the Ganges Valley, northeast of India. From there, the practice spread in every direction, acquiring a presence in all of India. As I said before, as well as to the West in what now is Pakistan and Afghanistan, to the North Central Asia, and even more so toward the East to China, Indochina, Korea, Japan, and even parts of Indonesia to the Southeast. But this didn't happen without the diversification of schools of thought and beliefs, even though all maintain the same core concepts. I told you that in India, Buddhism had been almost entirely eliminated by the Middle Ages, but it stayed in Sri Lanka to the south of India. There were other regions where it lasted only a few centuries. This was a case in the west of Central Asia and Pakistan, 
where the expansion of Buddhism met the empire of Alexander the Great. Once Alexander, the Greek king of Macedonia, had conquered the Persian Empire, a cultural syncretism occurred, a synthesis that is called Greco-Buddhism. It is in this area that there were Greek-led kingdoms after the collapse of Alexander's empire that overlapped with Buddhist regions and Buddhist populations. It is also in this region that the first statues of the Buddha were made, and they have a distinctively Greek influence. In the third century BC, for a short time, a large part of India was unified under a single empire, and its ruler was Emperor Ashoka. He promoted Buddhism, including beyond his frontiers, by sending Buddhist monks abroad, especially to Central Asia. His empire extended from Bangladesh in the east to Afghanistan in the west, which is why, even though the Buddhist presence in Central Asia has almost disappeared, this part of the world has some of the most ancient Buddhist statues and monuments. The art that resulted from this Greco-Buddhist fusion is one of a kind because it mixes Indian and Greek influences. But the blend of cultures was not limited only to the art. Several Greek philosophers were put in contact with Indian philosophers, and they returned to Greece to found schools of philosophy influenced by their understanding of Buddhism. Other possible influence, although speculative due to the lack of evidence, is a potential influence of Buddhists' thought on the early development of Christianity, not on the doctrine itself, but on the moral aspects that they have in common, such as respect for life, consideration for the weak and vulnerable, the rejection of violence and forgiveness of sinners. These are traits of Christianity that are not usually present or prominent in most Mediterranean regions. This doesn't mean that Buddhism was the influence that shaped Christianity. That would be a huge stretch, as plenty of other factors were at play in the formation of the Christian message. However, it is true that there was something similar in the message of early Buddhism and early Christianity. The disregard for existing social hierarchy, the disavowal of wealth, and the lifting up of the poor. Now, having reached Central Asia, Buddhism was now in the middle of the Silk Road that linked China to the Mediterranean Sea. But it did not expand further west, instead finding its way east toward China. The Silk Road was one of the ways through which Buddhism traveled to China in the 4th and 5th centuries, as well as through Tibet. I'll tell you more about Tibetan Buddhism in a minute. Like many other religions, Buddhism saw various traditions, various schools appear. It is hard to classify them individually because thousands of different institutions with different doctrines and philosophical approaches have existed or still exist within the Buddhist world. But the first broad distinction can be made between 
between two main traditions, Theravada and Mahayana. Both traditions accept concepts that we have discussed before. The middle way, the path to nirvana, the characteristics of all existing and living beings that they call the three marks of existence. The figure of the historical Buddha, obviously, but they also have their differences. Theravada means teaching of the elders. And it is the dominant form of Buddhism in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, including Myanmar, Thailand, and Cambodia. The Theravada focuses on a collection of Buddhist texts that are among the most ancient, and its followers see themselves as being closer to the early Buddhists schools. The second main tradition would be Mahayana, which means great vehicle, and it is prominent in East Asia. A lot of this variation derives from the Chinese Buddhist traditions, and it dominates in China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. This tradition accepts later texts and generally the existence of other Buddhas that the Theravada tradition rejects. Most Buddhists place themselves within either Theravada or the Mahayana, but these two categories do not really reflect the diversity of the Buddhist world. Modern scholars of Buddhism add at least one distinction inside the Mahayana. With a category called Vajrayana, also known as Tantric Buddhism or Esoteric Buddhism, that is mostly represented by Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. It is prominent in the Himalayan region, including Tibet and Bhutan as well as Mongolia to the north. This branch emphasizes the study of Buddhist tantric materials and is, to many Westerners, the prominent face of Buddhism because everybody knows about Tibetan Buddhism via the Dalai Lama. What does this mean, tantric? has more recently become a bit of a misleading term in English because a lot of people now associate it with sex. It became a thing in popular culture because of 20th century Western occultists who presented it to the American and European public as a kind of esoteric or sexual practice. This is not what Tantra really means. Tantra is a broad range of esoteric, meaning secret or mysterious, traditions that developed in India from the middle of the first millennium A.D. These traditions exist in Buddhism and Hinduism as well. To the Buddhists, the tantras are texts which outline the views and practices of their religious system, spelling out what to believe and what practices, exercises, and techniques to follow. From yoga exercises to meditation techniques to the use of mantras. Mantra is another term in Buddhism, and it means a word, a syllable, or a group of words or just a sound repeated during meditation that is believed by practitioners to have religious or magical powers. This is also an ancient tradition that appeared long before Buddhism. The earliest mantras were composed of Vedic Sanskrit, the language of the Vedas. 
a text from the second millennium BC that I told you about before. Tantra and mantras are somewhat linked because the practitioners of Tantra regard mantras as sacred formulas that become activated when recited. Mantras can be very simple, as simple as the sounds or word um serves as a mantra. This is the stereotypical sound most Westerners associate with meditation. But to some Hindus and Buddhist traditions, this is believed to be the very first sound that originated on earth. It is a very famous symbol written in Sanskrit, and though it is a very short mantra, it can be used in entire melodic phrases, believed to guide, reveal, calm, and expand perception. So, as you can see, despite popular cultural stereotypes, Buddhists or Hinduist tantras are not about some kind of mix of yoga and sex. They are a very esoteric and spiritual range of practices. Tibetan Buddhism, in addition to being based on Mahayana texts, emphasizes the study of tantras, which places it in a separate category. Now, China was also an important center for the spread of Buddhism, because it is from China that Buddhism continued its expansion into Korea, Japan, or Vietnam. The canons of Chinese Buddhism were written in the classical Chinese language, and these are not considered authoritative in Theravada and in China itself. New schools appeared. One of the most famous and successful was Chan Buddhism, which spread abroad and that we now know by its Japanese name, Zen Buddhism. Zen draws from different sources of the Mahayana tradition, and for the most part, it was a reaction against the importance of learning texts and doctrine. Instead of focusing on studying, it emphasizes a more direct understanding and practice, including self-restraint, the practice of meditation, insight into the nature of the mind and the nature of things to understand or perceive what they really are and also the expression of this insight in daily life to the benefit of others. So it includes a social dimension too. The Chan school was influenced by the Taoist philosophy that was influential in China at the time. And again, Buddhism also has plenty of different schools of thought in each country where it is present. Another difference between these various traditions, where we consider only the two big ones, the Theravada and the Mahayana, or include more, is that each acknowledges a different number of Buddhas. The term Buddha generally reflects to Siddhartha Gautama, but Buddha is a title attributed to any beings who have become fully awakened so there could theoretically be more than one Buddha. The Theravada tradition includes tales of 29 different Buddhas, 27 of whom were before Gautama, the one who spread his teachings. 
Kodama himself is number 28. And there is a prophesied future 29th Buddha. Mahayana Buddhists venerate numerous Buddhas that are not included in the Theravada traditions and are sometimes seen as living in other realms. In Vajrayana Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism, there are yet other Buddhas, including women. The most famous female Buddha is Tara, who, in the Mahayana world, is considered a bodhisattva, that is to say, not yet a Buddha, but a person who is on the path towards Buddhahood. In Tibetan Buddhism, she is a Buddha, almost a deity, revered as one who guides students to develop certain qualities like compassion. There is also variety in representations of the Buddha, especially in statues, all of which have different meanings. Maybe the least serious of these is the common representation of a fat and laughing Buddha, which does not really seem to embody the virtues of self-restraint, detachment, or the middle way. This version of the Buddha is typically Chinese and first appeared around the 10th century BC. This is not actually the Buddha, though. This is a Chinese Buddhist monk called Budai, who was rumored to be good hearted, happy, eccentric, and fat. He became a famous character in Chinese folk tales. The figure was endearing, and this is why it spread from China and became popular in neighboring Buddhist countries like Japan and Korea. But having a statue or a picture of this happy Buddha is more of a lucky charm than a religious artifact. Statues of Gautama the historical Buddha, show him as skinnier, and there are codes of sorts, meaning embedded in these representations. He is always represented in one of four possible postures, referring to different stages of his life, and his hand gestures provide further information. The four postures include reclining, sitting, standing, and more rarely walking. The reclining Buddha evokes the final stage of earthly life before reaching nirvana after death, and it represents this elevation to the awakened state. The most common depiction is of the sitting Buddha, which represents teaching or meditation. Sometimes the Buddha is very skinny, very emaciated, and this alludes to the period when he practiced extreme ascetism. The standing Buddha is a teacher and has already reached nirvana. His face reflects the gentle amusement and serenity that accompany his state. The position of his hands, also significant when the Buddha is seated. His hands can be joined or separated, and each of these positions holds meaning or refers to a particular episode in his life. For example, when he rests his left hand, palm up, on his lap, 
and his right hand is pulled down with fingers towards the earth. It is a reference to the moment during his meditation when he was tempted by Mara, the demon. When the Buddha is standing, if he presents the palms of his hands, it is a way of dispelling conflict and promoting harmony. Before we conclude our overview of Buddhism, we should attempt to answer this question. What is Buddhism exactly? Is it a religion, a philosophical or spiritual tradition, or a way of looking at life? The problem lies in trying to define it, because the concept of religion is a primarily Western construct. Historically, it is a convenient term meant to describe systems of beliefs, worldviews, texts, rituals, organizations, and moral values. However, this need to categorize and label these systems as separate entities, as different religions, is not universally understood or practiced. Outside Western languages, there is often no direct translation for the word religion. Our perception of the word depends on the individual or cultural perspectives we adopt to better understand the world. The word religion originated from the Latin religio and appeared in Old French and Anglo-Norman in the Middle Ages. Its original meaning in Latin when it first appeared in European languages, was not exactly the same as its modern meaning. It denoted respect for what is right, for what is sacred, and deference to the gods. After Christianity replaced the polytheistic Roman gods, it became reverence for their one God. In this sense, religion is not a choice between different beliefs. It is something that one either has or does not have. It was not used in the plural form initially. The plural religions emerged much later in French or English, particularly in the 17th century after the Protestant Reformation. This occurred as Christendom was divided, and European explorers encountered multiple foreign cultures, thus emphasizing that one's beliefs were only a single component among many in a person's identity such as, for example, nationality or race. To most scholars, the concept of religion, as we understand it today, is a Western conception and a relatively modern one, having existed for only a few centuries. In other world cultures, there seems to be no need to distinguish or separate everyday life from the sacred. There was no need to think of a belief system as a choice made by an individual. For example, even up until the 19th century, Jewish people did not call their religion practice. With its texts, morals, traditions, and rituals, Judaism, they considered their ancestral culture and ethnic identity to be one and the same as their spiritual practices, their natural rights as Jews. 
The same principle was applied by the West to many religions around the world. Cultural identity and spiritual practice were separated into two distinct categories. Mutually exclusive from one another. The terms Buddhism, Hinduism, or Taoism are very recent additions, appearing in Western languages only in the 18th and 19th centuries. In pre-Columbian America, in most of Africa, and most of Asia, there was no interest in separating different belief systems into religions. There wasn't even a word for religion. For example, the Japanese discovered the word and concept of religion in the mid-19th century when American warships appeared off their coast and forced their government to sign treaties that demanded, among other things, freedom of religion. The idea that religion could be optional or that they themselves had a religion was alien to the Japanese at the time. If we choose to define religion as the belief in or worship of a divine power, god or gods, then Buddhism cannot be classified as a religion. It doesn't require or refer to the worship of any superhuman power. While there are revered mythical figures in Buddhism, there is no pantheon or single god. In theory, a person could be a Buddhist and also practice a different religion. But it's not that simple. If we accept religion as a concept, as we have discussed, then other defined religions will likely clash with some of the beliefs of Buddhism, such as reincarnation or the possibility of finding a path to salvation without divine interference. These concepts may not be acceptable within many other belief systems in the world. However, if we take religion as a social construct, a community of believers who share rites, practices, and have a clergy and organization, then Buddhism can be considered a religion. It has an impact on practitioners and their social interactions. It, at least in part, defines their identity and helps fulfill their need for spirituality. There is no clear answer to the question. Is Buddhism a religion? It ultimately depends on how we choose to define religion. There is no scholarly census on this matter, and it is acceptable to see it either as a religion or as a philosophical and spiritual practice. This was just an overview, and there is much more to learn about Buddhism and Indian religions. I do hope tonight's story has at least sparked your curiosity to learn more. But we have reached the end of our exploration for tonight. Sleep well until we meet again. <laughs>